Hello everyone. Welcome again to a video message on the Kingdom of God. These are the sermons that I was planning to complete my time uh, at Christ Community Church with. And um, because of the pandemic, I put them on video now. I believe this is the fifth one. I didn't count before I started the video camera. Um, the fifth one in the series that I'm posting, there's 12 in the whole series, but I'm selecting a few to share with you. And this one reflects, uh, so we've been looking at the trouble Jesus had describing the kingdom of God to human beings. And he keeps having to use language of it is like, and he keeps telling about it in parables. And so we're going to look at some of those parables in Matthew 13 today. I'm not going to read them all. I'm going to read 13 starting at verse 44, and I'll skip around a bit. But they're all kind of in mind. And so here at, the, at verse 44 of chapter 13 of Matthew, we hear Jesus say it again. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. I jump to verse 51 now. After telling these parables, Jesus asks his disciples this, Have you understood all these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. I, I suspect there's an artificial confidence in their yes. He said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. New treasures as well as old. That's just a fascinating thing to think about on its own, particularly in light of things like the ancient path that I talked about before. In 1947, two boys were herding their sheep and goats in the Middle East in an area called Qumran, near the Dead Sea. They were doing a job, a task, that children have done for centuries in that area of the world, if not all around the world, taking the herd to good grazing in the hills and mountains. That day, one animal got away on them, and one of the boys went searching for it. He saw a dark hole in the mountainside he thought the goat might have gone into, but he was afraid to go into it himself, so he tried to confirm that the goat was in there by throwing a stone hoping to scare the animal out at the same time, or at least hear a sound from the animal that indicated it was in there. Instead of the expected startled animal sound, he heard the sound of his stone breaking pottery. He went and got his buddy, and together they went in to check it out. Inside, they found earthenware jars stuffed with rolls and rolls of ancient scrolls. In the full-scale search of the area that was then done, 11 caves with a total of 600 scrolls and thousands of pieces of scrolls were found. One-third of what was found was writing directly related to the Bible. Since then, these documents have been made available online, actually fairly recently, and have been used to help us gain understanding of how the Bible was shaped and how it was translated and and how it took form. Some of these scrolls are the earliest copies, uh, or very early copies of, of Bible writings. And so um, we can trace back errors that have been made in copying since then, and we know what was originally in, in the first one. That's just one of the many ways this find has been useful. So these boys, while going about their daily duty, had unexpectedly come upon one of the biggest archaeological treasures of modern times. They had found the now famous Dead Sea Scrolls. 
some 2,000 years earlier and about eight kilometers to the north of where the boys lost a goat and found treasure, Jesus told a parable of someone going about their daily duty and finding treasure. It still happens. Almost every week in the news, there's some story about found treasure. There are stories of people that just go on vacation together. This is not recently, of course, and go snorkeling and discover a ship. Or someone is cleaning up the attic during the pandemic time and finds, uh, finds a painting there that's actually a Van Gogh or something like that. In Jesus' day, valuables or treasure were hard to keep safe. There were no banks with safes and deposit boxes, no home alarm systems. And wars and raids were common. So people often buried their treasure, their life savings, so to speak. They hid it in the ground. There are even Bible stories which describe that. For example, Achan, who had taken loot he wasn't supposed to, had buried it under the middle of his tent. If he had died while away at battle, who would have known it was there? And so later, someone working the land where his tent had been might be surprised to find it. This parable, or these two short parables, are not about directly comparing the kingdom to treasure or to a pearl. The kingdom is a treasure. Jesus assumes that in the telling. It's a treasure beyond the everyday kind of treasure. It's exceptional treasure, you might say. But it is hidden at first. It is hidden to the unseeing eye. The way Jesus spoke this, the important thing is the sequence of events and the focus is on the response, the reaction to finding great treasure. It's about what people do when they find it, not about the finding itself or the treasure itself. In both parables, there's a sequence of finding, selling what was, and buying the new, going all in on the new. It's about what people do when they recognize the true value of what has been found. In the parables, the person doing the finding reorganized their life drastically so that this most precious thing that has been revealed to them becomes the center, the new focus of their lives. Having the kingdom revealed to you and you recognizing it and understanding it, Jesus is saying here, will have you do the same. Rearrange your whole life around the treasure. Think of the Samaritan woman at the well in John. She had been seeking to quench her spiritual hunger and thirst in harmful ways. But she reorganized her life when she was introduced to the treasure of living water and who Jesus really was. Another thing these parables make clear is that the kingdom is not something up in the blue yonder. It is not only a glory land way beyond the blue. No, it is something that can be discovered while going about your daily duties right here. Taking the approach that we now think Jesus might have had, and going about the looking for the kingdom being revealed in what God was al is already doing and becoming part of that is what the parable demonstrates. I believe I've shared before that I, I've come to understand, particularly from the Gospel of John, this picture of Jesus constantly being in tune with the Holy Spirit and the Father and just going about life 
always watching for what the Father had prepared for him, even as we're encouraged to do the same. And so when something was revealed, when he saw what God was already doing, he would enter into that. And that's what's demonstrated in these parables. We are shown that the kingdom of heaven is not something that is permanently hidden. Instead, the kingdom of God is something that has already broken into our present world. It is, in fact, hidden in the most ordinary places and in the most ordinary of events. It is as close as the treasure was close to the man working the field. How many times had he walked over or passed it before discovering it? That's how close it was. The parable also offers a striking contrast to situations and people who Jesus encountered where the reaction of the person in the parable does not occur. Take, for instance, the rich young ruler who wanted to know from Jesus what he had to do so he could be sure of earning eternal life. And Jesus told him to give away the things considered treasures to the kingdoms of this world and find new treasure in doing so. Kingdom of God treasure. It makes you wonder, especially the way he finishes was Jesus telling this parable with people like the rich young ruler in mind? The treasure the ruler was after was an earned treasure. I talked a bit about this last week. He wanted to know how exactly to work the field, how many times he had to go back and forth across the field to make it work out its treasure for him. He wanted to earn his own entry fee into the kingdom of God. But Jesus indicates in this parable that the treasure, while he's working the field, was right in front of his nose in the person of Jesus, standing before him, announcing the nearness of the treasures of the kingdom. The ruler was asked by Jesus, are you willing to sell all earthly treasure you have to get this heavenly treasure, to find it? Are you willing to lose everything you have worked so hard to earn, including your concept of salvation, to give that away in order to gain the heavenly treasure? Faced with the option of the kingdom treasure, the man chose not to sell everything in order to gain it. He hung on to what he knew and understood and valued, and in so doing, missed out on greater treasure. Why did he pass on this? He's a fool, we might say. Why didn't he go for it? Well, maybe it's because he senses that doing so will revolutionize his life, recenter, reorganize his life. It will turn all the values by which he has lived so far upside down and inside out and backwards. And if there's one thing in life people resist doing, it is overhauling their treasured values and rearranging their priorities. For him, not even the suddenly discovered treasure standing right there in front of him in the form of Jesus is worth doing that for. Often, I am the same. We are the same. We'd rather stick with what we know, what we've been raised with, than drop all that for the way of the kingdom of God to be revealed to us. Attending carefully to Jesus' kingdom parables is dangerous business. And because they are dangerous, we tend to listen to them passively. We simply think of them as cute stories, not massive directives for life, in life. Their purpose is, in fact, to actively engage and challenge us about where our treasure truly is found. After hearing or reading any of Jesus' parables, our appropriate thought to think, our most appropriate question to ask is, Is this me, Lord? Is it I, Lord? 
In this case, we need to be asking ourselves, have I been overlooking or missing treasure from you hidden nearby? Have I valued other things more than God's kingdom? Have I valued earning my own salvation more than accepting God's grace and mercy? Have I valued doing worship my way more than opening up to God's presence and reorganizing influence as I worship? Have I... Well, you go ahead. You write the question. Or ask the Holy Spirit to put the question for you on your heart. The second parable today, briefly considered, has something a little different going on. In it, the person is a seeker after treasure. They're actively looking for value. The person in the first parable stumbles onto it and recognizes it. This, per this person believes it's out there and is always watching for pearls of great value. The person finds it and drastically reorganizes their life so that this most precious thing that has been found becomes the center, the focus of their lives, and that is the kingdom. They, like the Samaritan woman, say, I have found what I have been seeking. And from that point, I've been found, I found what's been missing. I filled the hole in my heart with God. And from that point on, she reorganized her life and sought ongoing relationship with the true God in a healthy manner. Because of that way of being is the treasure Jesus is describing, the way of the kingdom of God. In July 2009 in England, an unemployed casket builder named Terry Herbert sought permission from farmer Fred Johnson to search for metal in his fields. Fred jokingly gave permission, saying, yeah, sure, I lost a wrench out there one time fixing a tractor. If you find it, bring it to me. So Terry began roaming the pastures that had once been a forest where roving military bands and bands of thieves would hide out. He walked the field with a $20, $10 metal detector and found buried treasure in Farmer Fred Johnson's field. By the time it was all dug up, there were 3,500 pieces, gold and silver bejeweled, and finely filigreed objects, mostly military gear, with several items that had biblical inscriptions on them. This is now referred to as the Staffordshire Hoard, and you can look it up on the internet. So yes, these things happen in real life. Terry Herbert was a seeker after treasure, and he found great treasure in earthly terms. Jesus, in his life and in these parables, is saying that hidden within our daily life is kingdom treasure within our daily life, under our feet, so to speak, every day, is kingdom treasure, is connection with God, is grace and mercy. Are you seeking that kingdom and not the kingdom of the ways of this world? And are you finding that kingdom in your relationship with God through Christ's sacrifice and the Holy Spirit's guidance along with his word. I sure hope you are. And in some ways, a pandemic time is a time to start afresh with exactly that kind of seeking and looking and waiting and watching. May all of us more and more actually find kingdom treasure and find ourselves reorganizing our lives around the ways of the kingdom of God. Until we meet again, shalom and serenity to you all.